I told you I was going on a mission. Now, many of you had figured out it's probably Israel. But I don't forecast exactly what I'm doing for obvious reasons. I'm not liked everywhere. And Mr. Producer, there's some people in the Middle East who might not like me either. And so, uh, particularly when I have some of the family with me, I can't pinpoint and announce exactly what I'm doing. And uh, we had a terrific man protecting us. He had an automatic weapon. We'll just say his name was Gabriel, and he was terrific. And I'll get into this a little bit with you, because I did it to report to you. It's one thing to talk about what's going on in the Middle East. It's quite another to experience it. We experienced it a little bit more than I expected we would, but we did, and so be it. And what I realized is how much of the reporting is BS when things are taking place in the Middle East. Complete BS. Even from some people who are reporting from there. Most of them aren't, but some are. Now, I had some meetings over there. I'm not going to get into them in specifics. With some very uh, significant people. Learned a great deal. And this is why I come behind this microphone with knowledge on these subjects. Not just shoot from the hip. And by the way, I want to also discuss tonight this impeachment fraud that took place. I want to also discuss tonight the Trump case, the Speaker of the House, and the funding for various allies, as well as the hearings that took place on anti-Semitism. We have a lot to cover. I just got back, obviously, literally got back uh, about five hours ago. And so, uh, first of all, the people of Israel... Don't all think the same way. Don't all practice their faith the same way. Some don't practice their faith at all. There are also Arab Israelis and other Israelis. They're Christians who live in Israel. It is a majority Jewish state, but it is a diverse state. And you will see many minorities there. You will see a lot of Ethiopians, because Israel some time ago... Uh, had a refugee lift from Ethiopia to Israel because the Ethiopian Jews were were being, as you can imagine, murdered and attacked. And so it's it is quite a melting pot in that sense. And when you look at the IDF, the IDF is filled with people of all backgrounds, all colors, all denominations, um, and that is true. One of the things I knew, but certainly was underscored when we were there, is the Israeli people are warriors. By that, <coughs> excuse me, by that I mean they will defend their country. Whether Biden wants them to defend it or not, whether Blinken wants them to defend it or not, regardless of what they say on CNN and MSNBC and the pages of the New York Times, it doesn't matter. They have nowhere to go. This is it. And they also know that this is their homeland. Very few people around the world can say that they can, they can literally identify their history going back over 4,000 years. Well, the Jews can. The Palestinians can't because they didn't even exist 200 years ago or 150 years ago. It's a whole nomenclature thing. They do know what's going on in the United States. They're quite concerned about the massive spread of anti-Semitism in our country. They're quite concerned about the lack of support or the uh, sort of the, uh, the support and the no support that's coming out of certain elements within the United States. They see what you see. They do listen to this station. I should say this program in Israel via the podcast and direct streaming. And of course, they have Fox, among other stations in Israel. Um, It is a vibrant country, but it's also a country that is different. What do I mean by that? We stayed in two different hotels, and you will have signs in different parts of the hotel on every floor 
that has the word shelter in bold and an arrow. So you're always mindful that you, you may have to run to a shelter because there might be an attack. This is constant in that country. It is constant. I want you to think about how that would work if you or we were under constant threat and missile sirens going off. And how that would be for your kids and your grandkids. They're not firing missiles willy-nilly. Whistles are willy-nilly being fired at them. Also, uh, you will see soldiers in the streets. It's not an overbearing presence, but very young people with rifles on their shoulders and so forth and pistols on their hips uh, walking certain of the streets, uh, whether it's in the old city of Jerusalem or other parts of the country. And they are starting to loosen their very strict gun rules so more and more citizens can obviously carry guns. I don't think they're loose enough from my perspective, but there you go. Many of the people there speak beautiful English. It is a completely westernized open society. Unlike what surrounds them which are throwbacks to the 9th century, even the 7th century. Which are terrorist organizations and regimes even the Arabs want nothing to do with. And so you have this this conflict between a, uh, a Western civilization, a democracy, people who believe in life, and believe in freedom versus a throwback uh, ideology in one form or another that could care less about freedom, the individual, or democracy, and have a centralized ideology, and if you don't comply, then they kill you, or they oppose you, or they do something to you, because they don't let it sit. And that includes Muslims who don't believe in terrorism. They are targeted in the Middle East. I'm watching this guy, McKenzie, who was one of the architects of the horrific surrender in Afghanistan. He was apparently head of the uh, CENTCOM at one point. And these guys who are failures as generals, they're brought on TV to give counsel and advice and input on what Israel should do or Ukraine should do or Taiwan should do. It's really baffling to me. McKenzie and Milley, even though they pointed out that they didn't agree with what Biden told them to do and Blinken told them to do, should be hanging their heads in shame for the rest of their lives. They should have resigned in opposition to what was taking place. We've had generals who have done that. Sing Lob is a perfect example. And uh, I wrote some notes here. He was on Fox on the Cavuto show with respect to Israel. They should take the win. Now, that's Biden. Take what win? Folks, 300 missiles were shot at, at their cities. My wife, Julie, my mother-in-law, my stepson and I experienced it. Now, they were shot out of the sky but they were shot at their country. Nobody says Iran should play defense. Those were offensive missile firings at the state of Israel. Now, I'm pretty sick and tired of people telling them what to do, but we wouldn't tolerate that for two seconds, and you wouldn't tolerate it if our government tolerated it. And some general... Retired, who's a complete loser, goes on TV, take the win? For his criticism of Biden in Afghanistan, he's repeating Biden right now. He suggests it's hard for Israel to take the victory, to accept victory. Accept victory? Those missile silos still exist. Those threats still exist. He says Israel's pretty much on its own. 
The UN and the rest of the world are telling them, don't do anything precipitous. What makes them think they're going to do something precipitous? If they do something, do something. That is hard and specific and does destruction. That's not precipitous. It says Israel has to balance its support from other countries. All these conditions placed on a country that's trying to defend itself. And the people trying to defend itself, their, themselves. From a guy who surrendered in Afghanistan, caused he, not alone, but the others, 13 of our soldiers to be killed. God knows how many American citizens are there. Nobody even talks about it. Nobody. But I got to thinking, I went on a couple of shows, they called me when I was there on Saturday, sitting in the, uh, I didn't go to the shelter. My wife didn't go to the shelter. We went to the parking lot under the hotel and uh, or right outside the parking lot. And I was stewing. I was furious that I was sitting there. First of all, I wished I could do something, which obviously I couldn't. But I was pissed at the fact that I was there. And I got to thinking about all this. I was reading information that was coming fresh over the transom from legitimate sources in the Middle East before they got to the United States. And I posted it for you. And I said, I've been doing a lot of thinking about the lunacy of Biden's Iran policy. Biden's position refusing to support Israel from taking offensive military action against Iran means that Biden will not support, listen, this is important, any military strikes against Iran's nuclear facilities, and that Iran will have a functioning nuclear arsenal with which to threaten the United States, Israel, the Arab world, and the rest of the world without fear of military attack. Now, why did I write that? Because that was the time for Biden to talk to Netanyahu about taking out those nuclear sites. We have our military there. We would back them up. They can take them out, and that would be that. But instead, he immediately says, no, no offense. No offense in military action. How many military or militaries around the world would say, okay, that's fine. No offense in military action when you're surrounded by Islamist terrorists funded by Iran, which is funded by the United States. How, 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 I mean, you're surrounded. This is a country of about 13 million, 7 million Jews, give or take, by a billion people. And everybody keeps saying Hezbollah has 150,000 precision missiles. Iran triggered October 7th. Biden paid for it. The best time for Israel to have hit Iran's nuclear sites with critical U.S. support would have been now, I wrote, meaning some days back. Biden's appeasement of Iran and intentional funding of Iran, lack of deterrence against Iran and efforts to crippling Israel's efforts to neutralize Iran's military and terrorist operations ensures that Islamist fundamentalist Iran will become a nuclear power. Then what? And once that occurs, there will be few options to limit Iran's ambitions short of a devastating confrontation with frightening risks. What will we do if Iran closes the Red Sea and other navigable waters used to transport oil? And it will also contribute even further to the firepower of China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, Axis, and cause other Middle East countries to acquire nuclear weapons. This is the world Biden and Blinken are creating while sanctimoniously lecturing about their efforts to de-escalate military confrontations. Again, the crucial point is that Biden has not only signaled to Iran that no effective action will be taken to stop its nuclear program, but Biden has actually acted to ensure that Iran's final path to building nuclear weapons is open and clear. 